Hello! We're going to be using Noon Setting Daily Prayer, page 296 in the Lutheran Service Book. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our hymn for today will be, uh, sorry, our psalm for today will be Psalm 91. Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my God, my fortress in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall on your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With, life, with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our text for meditation is John chapter 19, verses 25b to 27. So 25 uh, begins with uh, the closing comment for the soldiers dividing up, Jesus, dividing up Jesus' clothing. So we'll begin with 25b to focus on uh, Jesus and his relation to the women around the cross. So John chapter 19, 25b to 27. Then there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Joseph saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took him for his own. Took her for his own. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So a short reading, an interesting meditation on something that's happening around the cross. Um, but there's a difficulty with it, and I'm not meaning the difficulty of knowing who is who, which of the women is which. And it's actually difficult to tell, because in the Greek they're just placed side by side. So it says, his mother, sister Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene, it's not known... Um, whether, whether Jesus' mother, sister Mary, is the wife of Cleophas or the wife of Cleophas is a different person entirely. Uh, that's, a, that's been a difficult uh, uh, read for, for quite some time. Some people choose one, some the other. Now, uh, even though that's a little bit difficult to read, and, and uh, whenever you get lists like this, it's, it's um, uh, difficult to try and understand some of the lists. Uh, um, uh, with, with with some of the women, where is it, is it this woman and another woman, or is it this woman who's this and this? But the interesting thing is, what is what is Jesus trying to communicate to his mother and to the disciple John? So, beholding Mother Mary at the cross, Jesus looks upon her and has compassion on upon her, and says to her, woman, behold your son. 
and he's indicating over towards uh, uh, John the Disciple, that is, uh, the one who's writing this book. Because uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that title goes to the disciple who's been writing this book, and the author is referring to himself that way because he's not trying to promote himself, he's just the one whom Jesus loved. Uh, if he was trying to name himself, then he, was, then he would be trying to make a statement. But he's not trying to name himself here. He's trying to be uh, somewhat anonymous. And of course, since certain events involve him, he has to describe himself in those roles. But otherwise, he's trying to be anonymous. Uh, this is different than, say, um, uh, Matthew, uh, the the author of the Gospel of Matthew, who's also one of the one of the twelve. Uh, he names himself in his own gospel because there's the calling of Matthew. But it's interesting to read. Matthew's account of that versus, say, Luke's account, because in Matthew's gospel, uh, the calling of Matthew is describing him as Matthew, whereas outside of his gospel, it's describing him by the name Levi. As Levi would be, well, his, more, more so his family name, so he would be presumably of the tribe of Levi. And he would be recognizing himself according to his Hebrew name, but Matthew is a change in name, so he's recognizing himself as somebody different. Um, the same sort of reason why uh, Peter, in, in his letters, is calling himself Peter rather than uh, Simon or, or, or anything like that, because they're sticking with the name change, which is descriptive of the person. So uh, that might be to help people understand who's actually writing those particular books, whether, whether it be Matthew or, or Peter. But um, they're also trying to describe that they have been deeply impacted by our Lord Jesus Christ, and they're going by who they are in him. So Peter, given the name of Peter by Jesus Christ, is going by Peter. And Matthew may have received his name from Jesus. We don't know. We don't have that recorded anywhere. But he's going by his name, Matthew. So when we're looking at John and how he understands himself, he understands himself as a beloved disciple. He's understanding him as the one whom Jesus loved, not that Jesus didn't love everyone else, but he's recognizing himself as one Jesus has kept close so that he may be loved. And John doesn't elevate himself above the other disciples. He, he actually names the other disciples who actually come up, even Judas. Uh, he could have referred to Jesus, Judas as the one that Jesus despised, but he doesn't do that. Um, trying to put Judas off into obscurity. What John is really trying to say is uh, he is like all the others, but he doesn't want any special attention paid to himself. And that seems to be the case here. So even though Jesus has this um, a special message to his mother and to John, uh, here in, in John chapter 19, it's... And it's not recorded in any of the other Gospels, so it's very particular to John. Um, John is not trying to elevate himself. And he's also not trying to elevate Mother Mary. Because when Jesus addresses his mother, he says, Woman, behold your son. So he's not addressing her as mother. He's not addressing her as, as Mary. He's, so he's not naming her. Jesus is just referring to her as woman. And it's... Some people might say, well, this is a rather disrespectful thing to do, but it's not for this time and place. So in this time and place, it is perfectly acceptable for somebody to address a woman as woman. Now it seems to be somewhat condescending because we're trying to identify, because if somebody goes on the street and says, hey, woman or woman, uh, it might just be that someone is trying to reduce a person only to their gender, and that seems to be something particular to our time period. If we did this, uh, I don't know, about two centuries ago, it wouldn't matter much then if somebody addressed anyone as woman. But this is a rather, a relatively recent uh, development within our culture that we fi might find offense towards people just saying woman. So when Jesus is referring to Mar Mother Mary as woman, he's not trying to cause offense. He's, he's, not, uh, he's just going by a common uh, greeting at the time. A form of address at the time, and he's also not disrespecting her as his mother. Uh, also, by referring to her as woman, he's not trying to elevate her. He's not elevating her to his mother. He's not elevating, I mean, 
He's, he's not trying to address her as mother or trying to say, in this act upon the cross where Jesus is revealing himself to the entire world and showing the, his entire glory to all the world, because in the Gospel of John, the crucifixion is where Jesus Christ is most glorified. So Jesus is not mm, expounding his glory to his mother Mary in this, or, or to John in the sense of elevating them above all others, and John not naming himself or, or mother Mary is also trying to keep that pretty low. He's, he's saying, well, we're not being elevated there. We're not being recognized as the two names Jesus has on his mouth um, right, before, right before he is most glorified and, and finishes his work upon the cross. Um, this is just something that he is doing for the benefit of those in his midst. So Mary is not elevated by being addressed as mother nor being named, but she is just um, within the narrative. She is the one just who's there. And it's, and it's similar to uh, the woman at the well, because the woman at the well in John chapter 4 is another instance where Jesus addresses a woman by the term woman. So he says woman to the woman at the well. Again, he's not trying to degrade her. He's not trying to elevate her. He's just addressing her as one person addresses another. Um, and it would be no real difference if I went out and, and said, like, excuse me, sir, or um, hello there, or, or any other kind of common form of address. I would just be talking to whoever's in my midst. So when Jesus is doing that with Mary, and then he's also turning to, to uh, John and saying and to the disciple, behold your mother, um, he's making a relation between John and, and Mary, not a relationship between him and Mary, per se, because he's only addressing his woman, but he's creating a relationship between John and, and his mother. Um, and what is the goal for this? Well, the goal seems to actually be a fulfillment of the fourth commandment. As the fourth commandment, honor your father and your mother, uh, Jesus is recognizing that you are to honor your mother. You're, you're to honor your parents. Uh, you're to recognize the worldly authorities that God has placed over you. Uh, Jesus being born in the flesh does have a mother and a father. Uh, Joseph is not mentioned in the Gospel of John, but uh, he is mentioned in, in Luke and Matthew. Uh, I think, I think in, in, uh, in, not in the narrative, but in a... Uh, in a reference, offhand reference, he's also mentioned in Mark, but um, uh, he, he's actually featured in certain historical narratives in, in Matthew and Luke. So uh, Jesus is recognizing his worldly parents and seeing that he has to actually honor them. And part of um, a son, especially at this point in time, honoring the parents is to make sure that they're taken care of. Because a woman, especially once her husband is dead, and it is quite possible that Joseph is dead by the time of Jesus Christ's crucifixion. That might be why he's not mentioned um, after the birth narratives or, or um, not after the um, event when Jesus is 12 and he goes to Jerusalem and, and uh, his parents, Mary and Joseph, they lose Jesus and then they search for three days to find him at the temple. Um, so Joseph might actually have died after that event when Jesus was, was, was 12. And that's why he's not featured at any point in time in the historical narrative after that point. Could be. We don't know for sure. So if Jesus is trying to ensure that his mother has somebody to take care of her, what he's actually trying to do is he's trying to be a good and dutiful son and ensure that Mary is taken care of because it is up to the son to take care of their widowed mother. And if you don't have anybody to take care of the widowed mother, um, either in the sons of the family or, or her, her husband's um, brothers or their children, she would have to uh, fend for herself almost. She would have to glean the fields um, uh, in and around the territory that she's in so that she can get her daily bread. Uh, this is something that pops up 
in the book of Ruth and quite notably and, and central to the book of Ruth is trying to care for the people who are somewhat destitute, who are left without relations to care for them. So in the book of Ruth, Naomi does not have any sons to take care of her. Her husband is also dead and her family relations are fairly distant. So what Naomi has to do is actually glean from the fields, except she's in such an advanced age that she can't really do that. So Ruth, her former daughter-in-law, now without a without her son surviving, Ruth and Naomi have no actual familial connection except the ones that they're trying to forge uh, beyond the, the system at the time. We would say Ruth would be an adopted daughter of Naomi. She actually ends up being by the end of, end of the book. So uh, Ruth uh, has to glean the fields as one who is young enough to do so uh, in order so for Naomi to survive. So in order to take care of his mother, uh, Jesus gives her to John. So we see here kind of a, a caution for us that we should be honoring our mothers and our fathers, all those in authority over us, even at the point of death. Uh, this actually fits rather well with John's overall narrative, especially within chapter eight, chapters 18 and 19, because we're recognizing worldly authorities. And it's mainly in terms of religious and political power. The religious is when Jesus is going before Annas and Caiaphas as the unofficial and official high priests in, in the land of Israel. So Jesus is recognizing religious authorities there, and he's um, uh, making himself a servant to them as he is bid to do by way of God's commands, and is uh, sentenced, practically sentenced to death by them. And then he goes to a secular authority, the worldly authority that God has set up in an office over Jesus Christ, which is Pontius Pilate. And Pilate is also one whom Jesus recognizes as an authority and one who is set in place by God, and Jesus submits himself to, to Pilate. And now we're looking at Mary. Mary is, um, well, you could also say soldiers. Soldiers are also ones that Jesus Christ has submitted himself to and even surrendered his clothing to, as was the custom at the time. So Jesus is also recognizing soldiers as people in authority. And now we're finally coming to Mary, Mother Mary, as another one who is in authority, and Jesus is taking care of her and serving her in a way that is um, particular to him being a son. So as a religious Jew, Jesus is submitting to Annas and Caiaphas as, as a, and a citizen of, of uh, Israel. Jesus is submitting to Pontius Pilate and also to his soldiers. And as a son, Jesus is submitting to his mother. So we find here, even in the face of death, we are still to follow God's law. Um, but even in the face of God's law, we see the gospel which is Jesus Christ is ensuring that people are taken care of. Um, Jesus is actually going above and beyond the law by giving her a trusted or beloved disciple in order to take care of her. Because uh, Mary has uh, other sons. So it's recorded in the other Gospels that there were other sons that Joseph had. And there's always a debate whether or not um, these were Joseph's sons from a previous marriage or if um, Mary had these sons by way of Joseph. Uh, we don't have an affirmative verb from Scripture that it, they are her biological children, nor do we have conclusive traditions, because that, this is where it comes from, conclusive traditions that um, these sons were from a previous marriage by Joseph and, not, uh, and were um, adopted by Mary. We don't know. Um, if they were adopted sons, then it would make sense that Jesus would try to make a solid connection for Mary to be taken care of, which would be somewhat tenuous with adopted sons. Not, not, not greatly so, but somewhat. And, but in the other sense, if, if we're still talking about biological children, uh, these children would be presumably, these children would be younger than Jesus, so they might not be in a position to uh, finance themselves as well as, as their mother, because Jesus, when he's dying, he's uh, 33. So when you're a Jew, you come into your, the fullness of your trade when you're 30. So that would be when you would be able to take care of yourself, a wife, and a family. So if the other brothers are younger, Jesus would have to um, uh, help her, help his mother that way. So in any case, Jesus is going above and beyond the law 
when Mary has other sons to take care of her, to provide her with a, a beloved disciple that would actually love her as Jesus would try to love her. So all of this is showing how Jesus, even at the point of death, is trying to not only fulfill God's law, but also go above and beyond the law for those whom he cares for. So those whom he cares for includes us. So Jesus Christ is going well above and beyond the law because Jesus Christ does not need to die for his own sins, but he does die for our sins. So we actually find in Jesus Christ that we truly have something great here, that we actually have something way beyond the law, whatever the law has to offer us. And we are actually served by Christ uh, when Christ doesn't need to. But... Um, some, namely, namely Catholics, the Roman Catholic Church, have reinterpreted this verse uh, to mean something it doesn't exactly mean. Namely, that uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved is representative of the entire Church of God, and Mary is, well, Mary, so the disciple taking Mary into, her, into his home is the signal that the entire church of God needs to treat Mary as their mother and pray to her and, and uh, devote themselves to her, be subservient to her, etc., etc., etc. Now, we would disagree with this because this doesn't seem to be universal for the entire church. It seems to be very particular to, to Mary and John. Now, Mary actually comes up only twice in the Gospel of, of John. It's here at the crucifixion and then back at uh, the wedding feast at Cana in, in John chapter 2. The wedding feast in Cana is actually pointing forward to the crucifixion because, well, there's so too many things to get into right now. But um, one of the things, turning water into wine, that is having something resembling the color of blood at least, is looking forward to uh, towards the end of John chapter 19 here when Jesus Christ's side is pierced and blood and water flow out. So... Uh, that's part of what's going on, that we're actually seeing that kind of picture there. Uh, in, in the, at the wedding feast of Cana, Jesus tells his mother when she asks him to, to turn to um, help out the owner. Um, Jesus says, it is not, my hour has not yet come. Well, his hour has come for the crucifixion. Jesus proclaims this a few different times uh, in his, in his, uh, Last Supper discourse, John chapters 13 to 17, he's talking about how his hour has come. Um, so yeah, beginning of John chapter 17, verse 1, where he says, uh, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that your Son may glorify you. So the glorification of Jesus Christ at the cross is when his hour has come. So Jesus, when he's speaking to his mother that his hour has not yet come, He's really referring to the crucifixion. So when his hour has come, he's actually taking care of his mother better than she could have ever hoped to ask for. Because when she was asking him way back at the wedding feast of Cana, she was just asking him with the household chore, basically, is to get more, more wine for the owner. Um, and the same thing going on at the wedding feast of Cana. Mary is not named at all. She is not named at all in the Gospel of John. In fact, she's treated as a fairly minor character. She, again, she only comes up twice. Not named, not identified, and Jesus addresses her both time as woman. So he's not elevating her, he's not um, degrading her, she's just one of, the, one of the historical figures that happens to be in the story. And when he's um, fulfilling her command, he goes above and beyond his, his uh, call of duty. So what does this mean for the wedding feast of Cana? Well, um, he says, my hour has not yet come, but Mary tells the servants at that feast, do whatever he tells you. So when we look at that, Jesus, even though he's not obligated to, sh to show his glory at the wedding feast of Cana, he does so anyways. That is, he loves his mother and he's going to fulfill the promise. And again, with this, if Mary has not even asked for anything here. And Jesus is going above and beyond the law to make sure that she's taken care of. So what we're actually seeing is Jesus... Uh, kind of a portrayal of Jesus, not an elevation of Mary, but an elevation of Jesus. He is the one who goes above and beyond the law when he does not need to. He, he's always fulfilled this for us. He's always gone above and beyond the law for us. Uh, always healed us, treat, say, forgiven our sins, and done what is needed to give us eternal life. 
And that features throughout the first half of the Gospel of John, where the wedding feast is the first miracle being, being done. And then Jesus and the other six major miracles that are being accounted for in the first half of the Gospel of John, such as um, uh, the healing of the man by the pool of Bethsaida, the healing of uh, a, sick man, a man's sick son, um, healing the man born blind, raising of Lazarus, etc., etc., uh, the, the seven miracles that Jesus performs in the first half of the gospel is uh, Jesus going well and beyond the call of duty. Because if we're actually looking at what these people need, they're trying to figure out uh, what they, what, um, what they can do with what is at hand, but Jesus always provides more. So with the the people who are sick or lame, Jesus actually heals them so they can go about their business. He doesn't uh, say with the man and at the pool, the pool, the, the guy at the pool wanted to go down to the pool to be healed at a specific point in time, and he didn't was not able to do so because he could not use his legs. So Jesus, rather than helping him down to the pool, actually healed his legs uh, for the um, feeding of the five thousand. Uh, Jesus, there there was a huge crowd following Jesus. Jesus in order to take care of them, could have told them, go back to where, go into the town, feed, uh, buy food so that you may be fed rather than follow me around and being hungry all the time. Jesus could have done that, but rather he took what was at hand, some bread, some fish, and then multiplied them for all the people. So he went well and beyond this. Uh, for the um, man born blind, he would have been a beggar because the other other blind people in in the New Testament, they were all beggars. So Jesus, rather than giving him money, uh, gives him sight. Uh, Lazarus, who is dead, rather than Jesus just weeping and mourning, and Jesus does weep and mourn for Lazarus, instead of just leaving Lazarus alone in the grave until the resurrection on the last day, Jesus raises Lazarus right then and there. So Lazarus actually comes back from the dead, whereas Jesus could have just fulfilled things as they were supposed to happen by raising Lazarus on the last day. So Jesus always goes and be above and beyond the law to help us. So with Mary, this is nothing unusual, at least not for Jesus. So if we're coming to um, this event in the life of Jesus Christ, giving uh, Mary to John and John to Mary, um, yeah, we're, we're seeing Jesus going above and beyond the law yet again. It, it's not that Mary is anything special of herself, nor is John special of, of herself, because even when you're discussing these things with Roman Catholics, they tend to only focus on uh, Jesus saying, woman, behold your son. They almost always ignore uh, his command to the disciple, behold your mother. Because right then, Jesus would be making Mary almost on par with John in terms of commands. He's making a relationship between them, but he's not elevating Mary above the disciple. So if we're looking at, say, the disciple, because we do have more instances of John naming himself as the beloved disciple in Jesus' midst than we do of Mary being in, in the Gospel of John, then we should be looking at, well, does um, all the instances where Jesus is talking to the beloved disciple, does that mean that uh, we should be seeing ourselves at the, at the beloved disciple at, at that time and should we take whatever Jesus is saying to the beloved disciple at those times to be uh, normative for the entire church of God for all time? Now, if we're actually trying to test this out, we can actually go to John chapter 21. So a couple chapters ahead. So after... After Jesus reinstates Peter, because Peter denied Jesus Christ. So after Jesus reinstates Peter, um, uh, Peter turns about and saw the disciple, disciple whom Jesus loved uh, following behind. So John chapter 21, verses 20, 20 and following. Uh, who also had leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, who is that? who is it that will betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Meaning, meaning, meaning the beloved disciple, meaning John. So Jesus said to Peter, If I desire him to remain till I come, what is that to you? Follow me. Then there, 
who went out a saying among the brethren that the disciple would not die, but Jesus did not say to him that he would not die. But if I desire him to remain till I come, what is that to you? The same disciple is he who testifies of these things and who wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. So, um, there's an exchange right there. So, is Jesus elevating John? No. <laughs> um, is Jesus giving something special to John? No. Jesus is saying, don't be concerned about him. Do what I'm telling you, <laughs> telling you, Peter. And even if we're going to Roman Catholic theology, where they're placing everything on Peter, that Peter is the rock on which the church is founded for Rome. So they're focusing Peter as the first pope and that everything has to circle around him. Then why are you suddenly shifting everything over to John, specifically for that one passage in John chapter 19? So we're actually looking here. Uh, if we're looking at John, then Jesus is saying, well, anything anything could happen with him. He could, he could stay here or he could go on. And John is even denying that he himself is special in this instance where he's saying, well, Jesus didn't say I, I wouldn't die, that I would live forever right now. He just said, uh, what, what would it be to you if I, if I kept on living until Jesus Christ returned? So uh, John lived a Presumably longer than all the other disciples, all the other disciples, uh, almost all of them were, were martyred, including Peter. So John, <laughs> um, uh, he did die. So if we're looking at John as the representation of the church and the church is still continuing on and still living, then what is that to us? What, 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 why should we focus on, on John there? Um, we could also go to uh, John running like this is this is John chapter 20 um, right after the resurrection um, Mary Magdalene saw that the tomb was empty she runs to tell the disciples Peter and John run over to the tomb um, John gets there first Peter goes in John follows after Peter, um, and again, we have nothing particularly special mentioned about them there. Um, going back to the beginning, presumably, and we don't know for sure that John was one of the first disciples actually mentioned, um, might have been, I, I will say. So, in John chapter 1, verse 40, one, or sorry, Keep going before that. Uh, let's go to verse 35. The next, the next day, John the Baptist was standing again with two of his disciples, and he saw Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and follow Jesus. And Jesus turned about and saw them following and then said to them, What are you seeking? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They he went and saw where he was lodging and stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and follow Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And then we talk about Andrew for a while. The other disciple, which is unnamed, is possibly John. We don't know for sure. So if this was John, do we see anything very special? Well, we see John lodging with Jesus. Well, this is true for all the disciples. It was also true for Andrew. So why are we looking at John more so than Andrew? <clears throat> uh, it wouldn't make sense here. Uh, so, yeah, those are the major ones where I can think of John appearing. Uh, the other one would be uh, John reclining at Jesus' breast for for the Last Supper. But if we're also talking about John reclining at Jesus' breast, well, what about the other disciples? Um, does that mean that they're not representative of the church and only John's representative of the church? And should we be not following the example of the other disciples who stuck by, who stuck by Jesus, uh, as opposed to Judas who went away? Um, Jesus is not condemning the other the other uh, ten disciples for not at being reclining at his breast. Like we we have none of that. So, I mean, come up with Roman Catholics trying to elevate Mary. We don't really see an elevation to Mary within the Gospel of John. We see actually a downplay of of her because Jesus does not give her any special title. Uh, he addresses her like you would anyone. 
including the woman at the well, which he uses the exact same greeting for. And uh, he doesn't elevate John because John is uh, just the disciple whom Jesus loved. And there's all the other instances where he appears in the gospel. Jesus is not elevating him uh, above, nor is he giving John commands that um, are now representative of the entire church. So trying to read that into the text here just doesn't make sense. What we can actually see, though, is Jesus fulfilling the law, taking care of his mother, as one of a long list of authorities, the, going through the religious authorities, Annas and Caiaphas, going through the secular authorities, Pontius Pilate and the soldiers, and then going to um, familial authorities, meaning his parents, um, uh, Mary being the one present at the time of the cross. So Jesus is taking care of, or, or submitting to the authorities, honoring his father and mother, fulfilling that law, and going well beyond the law, actually acting in love toward them, as you would act in love towards all of us. All of us are actually receiving something well beyond the law um, from Jesus Christ. Him going to the cross for us far exceeds any requirement of the law that he has to love us, because loving, loving us would mean he would just follow uh, commandments 4 through 10, honoring your father and mother, into not covering. Jesus fulfilled these things, absolutely, but actually trying to die for somebody shows a love well beyond, well beyond the law. And this is the love that we experience and that we, rec that we receive through word and sacrament. Um, and we actually receive the life that Jesus Christ has uh, offered up at the cross so that we may live with him forevermore. Amen. So, uh, let us continue in prayer, beginning with the Curie, page 296. O Lord, have mercy upon us. O Christ, have mercy upon us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, you honored Mary and John at the cross by putting them together so that uh, they may fulfill the law. We ask you, O Lord, to be with us as we go through our daily lives, that you help us to fulfill the law. And we also ask you to go above this by um, displaying the love that you had for us upon the cross to all people, that we might not just limit ourselves to trying to fulfill the law as if we were trying to fulfill it for our sake, but that you would actually go forth and love one another well beyond what we are required to do, so that we may care for others as they need us. Please, O oh Lord, show yourself to others through our love, so that they may see the love you have for them, especially upon the cross, that you may bring them into life everlasting. In your name, O Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit into our hearts to direct and rule us according to your will, to comfort us in all our afflictions, to defend us from all error, and to lead us into all truth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.